Good afternoon and welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us today. We have our fourth quarter webinar and we're going to focus on tax and tax planning. So uh, this will be our last webinar for uh, 2019. And I'm going to be joined today uh, by Stephen Cutting from our office, who is a newer uh, wealth advisor with us, but comes with a ton of experience, uh, is a CPA and has worked uh, both on planning and uh, tax work for, for clients in the past. And uh, being part of our firm is a great resource. Uh, if anyone needs uh, any sort of tax planning or tax advice, uh, certainly uh, reach out to him and, and make sure you utilize those resources within our firm. So Stephen's going to get into a number of topics today. We're going to talk a little bit about uh, some of the recent changes over the past couple of years with uh, the tax code and, and new things to be aware of. Uh, 2019 tax uh, numbers and figures uh, to recognize as we head towards the end of the year. Some year-end tax strategies you can implement uh, in this last month. And lastly, I uh, have a focus on some charitable giving and how we can utilize some of these charitable giving strategies that will take advantage of, of some of the new tax laws and uh, how we could help potentially implement those strategies for you. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Stephen, and he's going to jump into the presentation. Good afternoon, everyone. For those of you calling in or listening in, participating from the Northeast, I hope you were able to successfully dig yourself out of the snow and uh, are, are um, doing well. So I'm going to get into the presentation. of the largest piece of tax reform legislation in more than three decades. Even though the changes were applicable to last year's taxes, since the changes were so significant, we thought it was important to remind everyone of what those key changes were. The most significant change made by the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act for individuals was a general lowering of the U.S. income tax rates. While the number of tax brackets remained at seven, the rates were generally lower with the exception of the lowest tax bracket of 10 percent. The standard deduction nearly doubled in 2018 over 2017. Another area of significant change in the tax laws involved itemized deductions, which were severely limited starting in 2018. By now, I'm sure everyone's heard of the acronym SALT, which stands for State and Local Taxes. The child tax credit doubled from $1,000 to $2,000 in 2018. And lastly, there was a significant increase of the amount of income exempt from AMT. So this, in effect, is a watered down um, alternative or um, alteration of the alternative minimum tax. For our small business clients out there, the corporate tax rate was reduced to a flat 21% rate. Corporate AMT was eliminated. There are significant limits to the expensing of interest from borrowing. And lastly, the IRS nearly doubled the amount of small business the amount a small business is allowed to expense under Section 179 depreciation rules. And for anybody who has any pass-through income, um, a significant change in the tax law involves a pass-through, a qualified business income, um, which provides a 20% deduction. Next section, I'm just going to briefly just cover and you know provide these just as a resource for our clients, the tax brackets, rates, and deductions. And the 2019 individual tax, tax rates are the same rates that were in effect for 2018. However, they were uh, adjusted or indexed for inflation 
in 2019. The standard deduction amounts were also adjusted for inflation in 2019. For joint filers, the 2019 standard deduction is $400 higher than it was in 2018, and it was increased by $200 for single filers and $350 for heads of households for 2019. This next slide focuses on the long-term capital gains brackets um, or tax rates. I always like to remind my clients, because um, not everyone is aware that a portion of long-term capital gains actually are not taxed. So this slide here demonstrates what those income levels are, and it, it's based on total income or total taxable income. So that includes any employment income, um, any taxable distributions from pensions or IRAs, um, as well as your capital gain income. But, you know, for example, a married filing individual, married filing uh, jointly, um, for if their taxable income is less than $78,750, their long-term capital gains are taxed at 0%. Not everyone's aware of that, so I always like to point that out. Next, I'm going to get into some year-end tax moves. Um, I'm going to start with postponing income. You know, income is taxed in the year it is received. Um, but why pay tax in 2019 if you can pay it in 2020? Or excuse me, 2020. Um, it might be tough or nearly impossible for employees to postpone wage and salary income. But you would be, should be able to defer a year-end bonus into next year. Um, so if, the, if you're in that situation and you're looking at, you know, infringing on a higher tax bracket or tax uh, rate, you might want to talk to your employer and see if you can defer that bonus until 2020, or excuse me, 2020. I'm not used to saying 2020 yet. Um, you know, if you're self-employed or you do freelance or consulting work, uh, you're, you know, you have a little bit more flexibility and you can delay, you know, your billings until late December. That's one way that you can ensure that you won't receive the money um, until 2020. And then lastly, you know, of course, deferring income only makes sense if you expect to be in a lower tax uh, rate in 2020. So, you know, be careful, be mindful of that. Um, just want to make mention of the 3.8% net investment income or NII tax. That's tied to a taxpayer's modified adjusted, adjusted gross income. So some taxpayers should consider ways to minimize or eliminate um, through deferring income any additional net investment income for the balance of the year. The 0.9% additional Medicare tax also comes into play for high wage earners, and that applies to individuals for whom the sum of their wages received with respect to employment and or self-employment income exceeds a threshold amount. It's $250,000 for joint filers, $125,000 for married couples filing separately, and $200,000 uh, in other cases. So to the extent that you have the ability to defer income in 2019 um, to avoid being bumped up into these thresholds and having to pay this additional tax, um, there's savings there of, you know, that, that you can have and, um, and recognize this year. Next, I just wanted to go over, you know, the another alternative is to accelerate deductions into 2019. Um, you know, if you're on the itemize or not borderline, your year-end strategy should focus on bunching. And by bunching, this is the practice where you time your expenses to produce lean and fat years. For example, you know, in one year, you claim as many deductible expenses as possible. So you bunch them together. So for 2019, you can accelerate 
your deductions and take those, uh, make those, incur those expenses, make those charitable donations, whatever the case may be. But the goal is to surpass is to surpass the standard deduction in one year, and then next year you just kind of cut back on those deductible expenses, um, and then qualify for the standard deduction. Okay. So since we're talking about itemized deductions, I thought it would be important just to run through some reminders. Um, because I mentioned earlier, the there were significant changes to the itemized deductions in, in 2018. So first and foremost, um, I mentioned SALT, the state and local uh, taxes and you know the the amount of state and local taxes is limited to ten thousand dollars so nothing in excess of ten thousand dollars by way of payment or incurring state and local taxes which includes real estate taxes can be deducted by a taxpayer miscellaneous itemized deductions which includes tax preparation fees unreimbursed employee expenses those were eliminated and, and are no longer deductible. Interest paid on home mortgage debt is deductible to the extent of debt up to $750,000. Um, and just as a reminder, medical expenses, those are still deductible, but the threshold now is 10% of your adjusted gross income. So anything less than 10% would not be deductible. Additional tax planning moves, um, you know, one planning strategy is to increase your withholding of state and local taxes or pay estimated tax payments before year end to pull the deduction of those taxes into 2019. This is, again, applicable only for those who are not capping out at the um, $10,000 of state and local tax. It might be, might not be applicable to many um, homeowners with real estate taxes but on top of state um, income taxes but you know if you're a taxpayer out there who is renting um, you might have some excess of the ten thousand dollars of salt um, and by, you can increase your withholding this year in 2019 um, to increase that deduction um, if you are mindful and are aware of being in a lower tax year, tax rate year in 2019, you might want to consider converting all or part of your eligible retirement account. Um, for example, your 401k, your traditional IRA, um, to a Roth IRA before the end of the year. Lastly, um, taking versus delaying required minimum distributions from your IRA. This would be applicable to anybody who turned 70 and a half in 2019. Um, when you turn 70 and a half, you have to start taking required minimum distributions, but you know, you can, in the first year that you qualify, you have the option of deferring until um, the, the next year. So, you know, you just want to weigh that out because if you, defer your RMD 2019 RMD until 2020 it might you're going to have to take two in 2020 and that might subject you to a higher tax rate um, additional tax planning strategies um, harvesting capital losses on any investments to offset capital gains if anybody's you know sitting on any stock positions that um, are less than what they bought, um, then they could realize a capital loss and use that capital loss to offset any capital gains in any of their brokerage accounts. Um, and any, you know, everything, it's a dollar for dollar match between losses and gains. And losses um, in total, it's any excess losses, it's going to be capped at three thousand um, dollars, but anything in excess of that is carried forward to the next year. So certainly look at any 
miscellaneous investments that you're holding, anything that's depreciated over the years from when you bought it, um, you might want to consider harboring some, you know, harvesting some capital losses to offset capital gains. Another, <clears throat> excuse me, another planning strategy um, that I like to mention is funding an HSA account before the end of the year. You know, a lot of companies are in the middle of open enrollment for the uh, 2020 year and, you know, or they, they might be on a new plan, um, starting on a new plan in December 20, 2019. But, you know, anybody that qualifies now for an HSA account, even if that qualification started December 1st, you can fund for the full year, a full year's worth of HSA contributions before the end of the year. And a lot of people aren't aware of that they might think that they're only limited to one twelfth, but they can fund a full year of contributions in 2019 as long as it's done before December 31st. 529 plans. Um, taxpayers, you know, if you plan to contribute to a 529 account this year, make sure you do so by December 1st, or excuse me, December 31st to take advantage of the annual gift exclusions and to qualify for any state tax deductions on your 2019 taxes. And just as a reminder, um, beginning January 1st, 2018, qualified expenses also included up to $10,000 of, of tuition expenses at private, public, or religious elementary, middle, or high schools. Next section I want to go through is just to talk about some year-end charitable giving strategies. Um, first one I'll mention, I think I mentioned earlier in the presentation, but you know, similar with other itemized deductions, taxpayers can consider bunching charitable don donations or contributions um, in the current year. So, you know, if there's someone that's you know, riding that line between itemizing or taking the standard deduction, um, if they bunch up and make their 2020 charitable contributions in 2019, that might be enough to put them over the threshold and qualify them for an itemized deduction in 2019, which is higher than the standard deduction. Um, and then conversely, next year in 2020, go back to taking the standard deduction because you've already funded all of your charitable contributions. Um, an effective strategy, one very effective strategy for bunching your charitable donations is giving to, an, to a donor advised fund. A um, donor advised fund, <clears throat> it's an account held at a um, financial institution, but um, the deduction is received in the year the account is funded. So um, you can increase your charitable, your charitable deduction and therefore itemize deductions above the standard deduction. Um, and then you have future years to actually allocate those funds to charitable um, organizations. Another strategy is considering making a qualified charitable distribution. A qualified charitable distribution is a non-taxable distribution from your IRA directly to a qualified charity, This, which still counts towards your RMD. When you make a QCD election, the amount you select will not be added to your adjusted gross income. So this is important for taxpayers to realize you're required to take a minimum distribution from your IRA um, but instead of receiving those funds directly from the IRA, you can instead direct the funds be donated to a qualified charity. And then that amount that you donate to that qualified charity, it does not become taxable to you in the year that that donation is made. Um, so you save on income taxes. Um, you don't also get a charitable donation, um, but you know, it, it's important because if you don't otherwise need the money or if you're otherwise going to be using other funds in a taxable account, say, um, you know, then you can do this 
and avoid, you know, and, and save on the income taxes on that portion of the RMD that you donate to a qualified charity. Charitable trusts allow donors, um, you can set aside assets for one or more charities. Um, they're great planning tools for individuals who own appreciated stock that they would consider donating to nonprofits. Um, and then you, 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 continue, you continue to receive the income on those positions. Um, it's just the, but you get a charitable deduction for the amount that you uh, put into the trust for the charitable organization. Lastly, for contribution strategies, um, you know, taxpayers should consider gifting appreciated stock. If they're sitting on positions that they've held for years um, and which would otherwise be subject to realized, you know, or capital gains, they can take, you know, say $10,000 worth of that stock and donate that straight, straight to the charity. Um, they get an itemized deduction for the charitable contribution of $10,000. Um, but more importantly, they, they get to avoid paying the capital gains on those positions that they donate. Lastly, I just want to go through some other, you know, some general charitable gifting reminders. Um, and, and that's uh, just ensure that you're, you know, your timely completion of gifts. Um, make sure that, you know, if you make any contributions to donor advised funds or any QCDs, make sure, you know, they're all done by December 31st. Custodians are already busy with it being year end. So you want to make sure you give any um, custodians or people in any back office amount, you know, sufficient amount of time to process any requests that you make. With regards to QCDs, um, those checks need to be cashed by the charity that you give the, the donation to. So it's important. We always recommend and advise our clients to call the charities directly. Um, just to make sure that that donation from their IRA, the check that came from the um, custodian of their IRA is indeed cashed before December 31st of 2019. Regarding non-cash donations, obviously just dropping those off before the end of the year. And then with respects to cash and or credit card donations, um, charitable deductions are allowed in the year they are paid. So this means that if you charge the donation on your credit card uh, in 2019, but don't pay that credit card until 2020, you'll still get the charitable donation in 2019. So that's um, also a way of, you know, if you're strapped for cash at the end of the year, considering making the donation using a credit card, you'll still get the donation in 2019. And regarding any checks, um, donations made via checks, as long as it's mailed by December 31st, 2019, it qualifies. In the last section of the, the presentation here is a 2019 year-end financial planning checklist. It's just um, a number of different items broken out um, by categories showing target dates, um, and just reminders, you know, whether it's, you know, taking your required minimum distribution, um, making any deferred comp elections, you know, anything that's, you know, affecting, you just have to make sure those are done by the applicable dates. Um, you know, the funding an IRA or a Roth, those are always the, by the date of the filing of your 2019 tax return. So that's April 15th of 2020. Um, income tax planning, you know, make any adjustments to your withholding, um, you know, any charitable contributions, make sure all that's done before December 31st. So as I mentioned, these there, it's a checklist and we actually have a PDF that we'll send out, um, to the, to everyone as well. Um, so they just, an, Again, just a reminder for them of all the pertinent 
dates and applicable dates um, that are important to be mindful of. And then the last slide here is, you know, just key milestones. Um, you know, age 50 or older, clients can make catch-up contributions to IRAs and some qualified retirement plans. Um, straight down to age 70 and a half, when you have to start taking your required minimum distribution. So all of that will be on the PDF um, that we'll send out to our clients um, just to help them make any, you know, year-end planning, um, you know, for financial planning or, or tax uh, strategies. But if anybody has any questions about any of these specific um, strategies, Feel free to call me in the office. I'm happy to assist um, and answer any questions that you may have. Thank you for your time. All right. Thank you, Stephen. That was some great information, and uh, especially some of these last minute tax strategies that you can implement. So, again, any of you out there that do have questions or would like to go through any of this, uh, please give one of our advisors a call. Uh, we'll be able to assist you and uh, bring the right people into. Um, help anything we need to uh, take care of. And even if we have to get involved with uh, an outside CPA that you work with, uh, we're happy to coordinate any of these discussions. As I mentioned earlier, uh, this is our last webinar for the year. As we get into the start of 2020, uh, we typically do our uh, quarterly webinars in the first couple of weeks of the quarter. Uh, for, for the first one, for Q1 of, of 2020, because we will be doing our state of the economy presentation uh, the week of, I think the dates, we haven't sent out to save the date yet, but looks like it, they'll be coming out um, shortly in the next couple of weeks, but we will be holding it uh, January 22nd and 23rd. Uh, we'll use that presentation really as our, as our kickoff to uh, 2020. And as always, we'll upload that to our blog and, and email that out to all of our clients. So again, uh, any questions before the end of the year? please give us a call. And uh, if not, if we don't hear from you, have a happy holidays. And uh, we look forward to catching up in the new year. Thanks again.